So this is where I collect my pine resin. I come out here every week or two and just pull some off the tree, put it in a little tuna can. Pine resin. So this is one of the trees that I've tapped for resin. And as you can see, production is good. Ugh. Got a whole bunch down here on these leaves. So it is literally just oozing right off the tree. Um, now I know some of you environmental people are like, oh my God, you're killing all those trees. Number one, these trees have got to go anyway. So eventually these are going to get turned into fatwood. No fat wood in there. Now, the more that you attack these wounds, basically the more resin this tree is going to keep producing. So this is um, one way to do it. Another way would be to cut like a cat's eye kind of thing where you've got a strip of uh, cuts going this way and a strip of cuts going like this and then drain them into a little collection cup at the bottom that's the way it's done in some places and on rubber trees but I like this method it just feels kind of natural and homey and it's like already rosin it's powdered up it's not even that sticky Just like that, we got a tuna can full of pine rosin. There's uh, resin slash rosin. I mean, uh, a lot of the, the turpins have already dried off of this stuff because I haven't really been collecting it so close to the tree. It's all like gummy and sticky. Look, I'm ready to go climb a, climb a mountain now because my hands are coated in this powder. So the powdery stuff is actually um, closer to being rosin while the stickier stuff is more like the, the actual resin and it smells heavenly like this is one bushcraft activity you can do and your girlfriend or your wife is going to think you're burning incense instead of like doing something gross Alrighty, so here is basically a breakdown of how this all works um so nomenclature when it comes to pine pitch pine resin pine tar um, is terrible, okay? There are numerous reasons for this, but I think one of the primary reasons is that historically the nomenclature is not agreed on by anybody from the Norwegians to um, people in Indo-European societies to the boom up of this stuff in the 17 and 1800s when people started doing a lot of dry distillation of wood. So there's... <clears throat> Like, all the names become interchangeable. All right, so I'm going to put forth this just an idea of a way that we can distinguish all these things based on what they are. So you start with an injured tree, and this is where you're going to get your resin. And this comes from conifers, um, so any kind of evergreen, most evergreens, anything with, like, long pointy needles. Cedar's not so good for it. Or this eastern red cedar and junipers are not necessarily so good for it they produce some resin too but it's not really the same quality um any injured tree will produce resin so but the resins and the gums that come out of some trees are different than others so for what we're talking about i think pine trees pine trees fir trees um and spruce i think can also be used for this but i don't have any spruce here so i'm not going to prove it to you so you start with an injured tree and that injury produces resin. So the tree basically exudes this stuff. So distinguish between resin and sap, first of all. Sap carries nutrients from the soil into the tree. It carries waste products from the tree and puts them back into the soil. It's like the lifeblood of the tree. Resin is more like a scab, okay? So the resin oozes out of these injured areas. It coats it, it seals it, and waterproofs it and it basically is used to keep bugs from attacking that injured spot of the tree because bugs will attack sapwood readily when uh, when the bark is scraped. It acts as an antimicrobial, an antifungal, 
all these different things, which makes pine tree resin actually incredibly useful as a sort of bandage in the field. So if you're in the bush, you get a cut on your hand, you don't want it to get infected, you can just get some of this pine resin or pine sap, and smear it on there, and you're good to go. It'll even act as a suture because of the, the stickiness of it. So it makes a good bandage for the same reason that it protects the tree. <clears throat> From this resin, we now have fire unlocked. Um, you put these together, but the resin, if you heat it up, basically this resin is composed of two types of ingredients. So you've got the rosin that's in there, and that's more of the, the solid glassy stuff that we're going to turn into glue. The rosin is, when it's in resin form, is actually rosin combined with a solvent. That solvent, in the case of pine trees, is spirit of turpentine, which is mostly turpentine, some other little ingredients, a little bit of water, um, all this together in there makes sort of makes it sort of gooey. And so as the stuff dries out, you'll notice it'll harden over time. So you'll find chunks on a tree that are just hard as a rock. And it's basically started to produce a rock called amber. So if the rock, if that chunk like hangs around long enough without being disturbed and buried in the soil for who knows how many years, eventually that'll harden up so much that it'll fossilize and turn into amber. Um, but in either case, all these turpins have to be released from it so that it can dry out completely. <clears throat> Once that, that stuff can be released with heat, so turpentine will actually boil off of the surface of the resin at around the boiling temperature of water, at about 100 degrees C to 120, 30 C, like all that stuff comes off. Now, when you watch these bushcraft guys in the video, they're gonna be like, oh, don't heat it up too much till it starts boiling and all this nonsense. Um, the rosin is the stuff that's gonna make your glue strong. This stuff is going to keep it sort of runny because, I mean, it's just like adding paint thinner, right? And if you have a still, you can actually distill the spirit of turpentine separately from the stuff that's in the can. Now, again, historically, this is sometimes known as tar, the stuff that's left over. Um, I think that's inaccurate, but it will darken if you heat it up too much and it'll start to scorch. And that produces a type of tar. Now, tar is one of those terms that's used for all kinds of stuff. Um, there's no getting around that. If you were to let this rosin cool off, it would form like a type of glassy substance. I mean, it's basically like making um, fake glass out of sugar. You know, you heat it up, you liquefy it, and then you let it cool, and it makes the sheet of, like, glass sugar, you know, where everything's, all little carbon chains in there are intertwined, and it's just like a sheet of glass, except it's much more brittle, and it's a hell of a lot less strong. That happens because this is a, a type of polymer, okay? So the stuff in the rosin is like these long carbon chains and they kind of intermingle and they grab each other by the hands and they form longer and longer chains and it makes like sort of a, a network, almost like a crystal, but like the same kind of network that's in glass. is all these little polymers that are kind of stuck together and they're all linked and then when they freeze they harden up and they stay in that shape and they vitrify which means they turn glassy. Um, to prevent them from being extra brittle or extra uh, to prevent them from being extra brittle you want to mix some other stuff in. Now you can use all kinds of things emulsifiers, um, solvents, <clears throat> just regular impurities. I mean, there's a long list when it comes to making glue of different ingredients that you can add in. It's the same as making ink. There's just dozens of different types of ingredients that you can add. You can use different ingredients for the same purpose. So there's literally endless ways to put this together. But the simplest way to make regular pitch is to add powdered charcoal, um, you could also use grog, which is basically fired clay that's been broken back down and then turned into a powder. Or you can use some mixture of the two. And bladesmiths are familiar with these things for a natural adhesive to fix a blade into a handle. Um, 
So yeah, um, basically what these impurities do is the little polymer chains are in there trying to grab hands with each other and then you introduce some other little element. So instead of grabbing each other, they'll grab onto, one of them will grab onto this side of the impurity, the other one will grab onto this side of the impurity, and then they've like got a hold of that. They can't form these long complex chains as they dry, so they don't harden as much and there's just a little bit of brittleness to them. Um, as far as other impurities that you can use, classically beeswax was added from around 10 to 30 percent of your final solution is beeswax and that will actually make the glue sort of flexible because the beeswax will mix in the same way and beeswax is incredibly flexible whereas rosin's incredibly hard and brittle so those two mixed together in the right proportions will make um, the glue a little more flexible I don't have any beeswax so we're not going to be doing that today and for hafting things like hafting stones to sticks you don't really need that to be flexible anyways, so it's not really important. I mean, I, you could use rosin and it would work perfectly fine for arrowheads, in my opinion. It's just every once in a while you'd probably have to heat it up and reapply it because you'll get little cracks and fissures, but you're going to break the arrowhead before that happens. <clears throat> so you take your charcoal from your fire that you're using to heat up your, your tar and, or your rosin, and you mix it. You basically mix the liquid form of this rosin or whatever's left of the resin. You're not going to get rid of all the turpentine, more than likely. But you'll mix what's left of the resin with powdered charcoal to make pitch glue. So when you come out of the other end, you're going to find that you have different amounts of everything. Okay, so there's probably going to be a little bit of the spirits of turpentine in there. Most of the water will be gone. It'll evaporate out fairly quickly because there's not a lot in there to begin with. But you'll have charcoal, um, this rosin, and then you'll have some of the spirit of turpentine still in there. So it'll still have kind of a soft effect sometimes. Um, but eventually, over time, that's going to work its way out and evaporate on its own as well. And what you end up with is pitch glue, which is incredibly strong. It'll stick to just about any surface, and it will bond things together. So porous surfaces, non-porous surfaces... The only thing with this is it has to be applied hot and then as it cools, those little chains link together and they just fuse everything into a mass. And I have a fly trap stuck to my head. So that's the basic science. Tree, resin, heat it up, mix it with charcoal, bam, glue. And of course, this is reusable. If you reheat it, it'll melt back down and you can just mix it up again and reapply it to whatever you want. It's incredibly durable, incredibly tough stuff, and it works better than any other natural adhesive that I've found to date. Okay, so here's some of the stuff we collected. I've got it sitting here on the wood stove, so it's kind of bubbling and starting to come up, and this is one from earlier. see this or not it's it's quite liquidy um so it flows very easily i'm just gonna pour this one from earlier into the, the other pot here i'm probably gonna strain some impurities out and then just pour this out into some kind of mold where i can like make it into a solid piece of rosin so that if i want to make glue later basically i have it all right, I'm going to try and strain it. So I've got a little strainy here. Shouldn't have any problem with the temperature. Um, this guy is starting to bubble again. I just turned up the heat on the wood stove a twit. Um, but I'm going to see if I can separate some of this nonsense out of here. And see if this works or not. So some of it's draining through quite well. Some of it's taking its sweet time. Take this, put it back in here. Into my jelly mold. This would make one hell of a fire starter, so um, there's no reason whatsoever to throw it out. So I didn't filter everything out, but it did a pretty darn good job. 
I'm gonna let that continue to heat. It's still got some bubbles coming off of it, so there's still um, solvents and stuff in there. I'm gonna let that continue to dry off a little more and then we'll pour it onto a piece of wax paper and see what it does. All right, so I've made a terrible error here. Um, my strainer actually, let's see if I can give you a shot of it. Oh, it's all sticky. Actually managed to melt a hole right through the middle of that guy. So, um, plastic strainers beware. From now on, we'll only use metal strainers for this kind of thing. The lesson learned, it's all good. And uh, I've got some wax paper here in another tin. And this is, I've set this off to the side. It's still very, very watery. And I'm just basically going to pour this guy in here and let him set up and harden. Okay, so I pulled my pine resin mold out here. I just basically reached in there and plucked this uh, wax paper out. And we're going to see if the wax paper did its job or not. Oh, yeah, it did. Still a little sticky and I'm trying not to get fingerprints on it but you can see it peels off it's very very brittle but also very pretty and shiny this is the good stuff as they say this would be my little rosin now if you wanted to make glue out of this you can make it out of this alone but it does end up you can see how it's kind of crunchy and brittle um, that might not be the quality you want depending on what your application is going to be um so you can do a couple things you can mix in some charcoal like i talked about and have an impurity in there or you can use a plasticizer and the most natural plasticizer for this is beeswax so mix about 20 about one part beeswax to four parts um of resin or rosin either one and uh it should give you a little bit of flexibility to your glue